Should it all be on the United States to solve this problem? So this is it. This, this is the hideout. This is uh, this is where I'm living. Kushner is very bad uh, student. He don't know nothing. President Trump is responding to the latest warning from Iran with a tweet that threatens both overwhelming force and obliteration. Earlier today, Iran's President Hassan Rouhani said new sanctions from the U.S. only mean the end of diplomacy. Illinois became the 11th state to legalize recreational weed and the first to legalize its sale through legislation, not through a public vote. The law goes into effect January 1st and means a cleaner record for about 800,000 people. This legislation will clear the cannabis-related records of nonviolent offenders through an efficient combination of automatic expungement, of gubernatorial pardon, and individual court action. Federal prosecutors unveiled new evidence in the case accusing California Congressman Duncan Hunter of misusing $250,000 in campaign funds and lying about it. Today, they said Hunter spent some of that embezzled money on enough drinks, Uber rides, concert tickets, ski trips, and hotel bills for five extramarital affairs. Which may explain why last week, his wife started working with prosecutors, who Hunter accused of carrying out a, quote, smear campaign. Stephanie Grisham, the communications director for Melania Trump, is moving to the West Wing to become the new White House press secretary, a big job that may now be totally meaningless. Outgoing press secretary Sarah Sanders hasn't briefed reporters in 106 days. Jared Kushner is in Bahrain today unveiling his grand plan for Middle East peace, or at least phase one, which is to develop the Palestinian economy. My direct message to the Palestinian people is that despite what those who have let you down in the past tell you, President Trump and America have not given up on you. The Kushner plan calls for raising $28 billion in investment into the Palestinian territories and billions more for neighboring Egypt, Jordan, and Lebanon. But all of the famously intractable political questions, whether there can be a two-state solution and the status of Jerusalem, all of those are being left for some later date. Khaled al Junaidi is a Palestinian olive farmer who, 10 years ago, came up with a plan for a joint venture between Palestinians and Israelis. Not oil. The US government at first agreed to fund it. But in 2018, the Trump administration decided to impose massive funding cuts on the Palestinian territories. Janadi is still bitter at how the administration treated his project. So imagine his surprise when we told him that his face was being used in the glossy White House brochure promoting Jared Kushner's peace plan. Did you know that they're using your your image in these proposals? The Kushner plan, yeah. You didn't know that they're using your your face? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this uh, This is the report. This is the White House website. That's you, right? This is this is from olive oil without borders. Crazy, 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 crazy. This is not good. They didn't tell you? No, 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 no. This is not good. That's the first time you've seen that? Yeah, the first time to see it today. This is before many years. This is Think. old. This is yeah, you, before st- you still have hair. In that time, you still have long hair in yes. this picture. I said Kushner is very bad uh, student. He don't know nothing. <laughs> That disappointment is common amongst Palestinians. In the past couple days, there have been widespread protests like this one in Ramallah. Those who'd normally welcome investments into their economy, like aspiring business student Mohammed Hayek, say Kushner's plans are fatally flawed. Hayek 
Hayek currently works in a chocolate factory, making around $550 a month managing the production line. He says the plan overlooks something fundamental. Do you think having your own company, building your own business, is possible in these conditions? Hayek's boss, Marzin Sinekrat, is one of the biggest Palestinian businessmen around. This is the invitation that we had received from His Excellency, the Minister, the Secretary of Treasury. So you didn't even consider going? No, I didn't even consider going under, under the circumstances mm -hmm. of today. You cannot tell me what's mine is mine and what's yours is mine. Let's talk. It cannot work like this. What's, what's yours is yours and what's mine is mine. Let's talk. It makes better sense. But now saying Jerusalem is not there on the table anymore. So we cannot talk about it. Borders are not there anymore. So we cannot talk about it. Your sovereignty on land is not there anymore. You cannot talk about it. Settlements have to grow and settlements have to be annexed. Israel, you cannot talk about it. So what is left to talk about? As simple as that. To talk about piecemeal approach, some cosmetic surgery here and there, this will not give stability, this will not give prosperity, this will not give life to a Palestinian independent state. Isn't there a danger that you'll just be completely cut out of the process moving forward and that you know these things are going to be decided without your engagement? I mean, Bahrain, the conference is going to go ahead even without your attendance. So, Warsaw so. conference also went ahead without us, if you remember, in Warsaw. I think that this, uh, this conference in Bahrain is not for us. This is to normalize Israel economy with the Gulf region. It's as simple as that. For the Palestinian leadership, there's an air of disbelief around Kushan's proposals. President Mahmoud Abbas doesn't even seem to be taking them seriously. Mr. President, Mr. President have you read the report? Hmm? Have you read the report, Jared Kushner's report? <laughs> I am waiting for you to tell me about it. <laughs> Abbas has refused to engage with US officials since President Trump recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital. He sees the deal as a one-sided plan to give Israel everything at once. About a hundred miles northeast of Jerusalem, close to the Syrian border, there's a striking example. We're fans of President Trump, okay. and we had uh, planned a family vacation okay. to, to Israel for several weeks. But as part of it, we wanted to come see uh, Trump Heights. What do you think? It's, it's wonderful. It's really amazing. I think uh, the area has a whole lot of potential mm. and could be, become something very great and wonderful. Golan Heights Deputy Mayor Gal Gaffney expects hundreds of families to move here once construction goes ahead. And for him, the plan is really about recognizing what Israel's established as facts on the ground. In fact, he thinks that's been Trump's strategy all along. He's not just a good friend. He is a good friend of Israel. But for what he, for what he did with uh, the, in Jerusalem, recognizing Jerusalem and moving the embassy, and with the Golan, and of course with Iran. How do you explain that the, this is the, the administration's strategy? My best explain is that we won. Think of this as today in immigration. It's always an important issue, but the number of headlines that pop today point to how large the problem has become. After lawyers and activists complained of kids being detained in squalor on the Texas border, officials reportedly scrambled to move migrant children. But today, about 100 kids were moved into the same facility. This afternoon, acting CBP chief John Sanders abruptly announced his resignation after calling the problem CBP deals with, quote, some of this country's most difficult. Yesterday, the Mexican government announced they'd sent 15,000 troops to its northern border to intercept migrants. It was an unprecedented move praised by the White House. 
But then Mexico's president denied that the soldiers were there to stop migrants, despite some disturbing pictures from the weekend. And today, the House of Representatives was poised to approve $4.5 billion in emergency funding for border operations. But the Senate's version of the measure is, as usual, different. And while all that's going on, the clock keeps ticking for Mexico to find some way to slow the flow of migrants who are still trying to get to the United States so it can avoid the economic wrath of President Trump's threatened tariffs. And the Trump administration keeps pushing a controversial solution that the Mexican government is desperate to avoid, a safe third country agreement. Maureen Meyer, a human rights activist who's worked in Mexico, explained the concept to me. A safe third country would be that anybody that set foot in Mexico before reaching the U.S.-Mexico border would have to automatically request asylum in Mexico and not the U.S. And if they go to the U.S., the U.S. can send that person back to Mexico and say, no, we have an agreement with Mexico and you have to request asylum here. The Trump administration has been leaning on Mexico to sign one for months, as acting ICE chief Mark Morgan told reporters recently. A safe third country would really mandate Mexico step up and, and really do more of what I believe they should be doing. Now, Mexico has said it will consider signing one if it can't curb migrant flows by late July. But it wants its neighbors to sign on, too. So Trump officials have been pushing Guatemala on this. While both countries want to keep the U.S. placated, neither really has the resources to handle the influx of people we've been seeing. How do you define safe? You have to, one, have a functioning asylum system, so a system that's shown to effectively be able to process fairly cases. In Mexico's case, up until three or four years ago, they only had 15 asylum agents for the entire country. The other safe part is countries returning someone back. We need to guarantee that person isn't going to be subject to persecution. So either further persecution in a country like Mexico, which has record levels of violence, or because the system fails so much that they actually end up sending that person back to their home country. There's also a question of why is it the U.S.'s responsibility to take care of these asylum seekers? So there is a sort of shared responsibility to this too, because a lot of the violence in countries like Mexico is in part due to the U.S. demand still for, for illicit drugs. But isn't there a valid argument in in this idea that Mexico should be helping with this problem and the Guatemalan government should be figuring out what to do. I mean, the thing is, why should it all be on the United States to solve this problem and let everybody in? It shouldn't. And I think the, the bigger issue is it should be every country in the region has a broader responsibility. Mexico is a bigger country. They can and should be doing more. But I think the other factor is this shouldn't be the U.S. washing its hands of our international responsibility. Is it? It's a country that's history of receiving refugees and asylum seekers and where you have set up programs to absorb a larger number of people. And it's also not just asylum. It's what can we do to address why people continue to flee their country? How can the U.S. and Mexico work on cooperation with civil society in Central America, with the governments to address corruption, to address climate change, induced poverty. There's a lot of things that we should be focusing on beyond trying to stop people from coming to our border. This is the story of how a bill dies, without anybody ever voting on it. Over the weekend, a crowd gathered to support a group of Republican Oregon state senators. But the senators weren't there. On Thursday, the state Senate was supposed to vote on HB 2020, a climate change bill. Democrats supported it. Republicans said the bill would cost jobs in rural areas. But Republicans are outnumbered in the Senate. So instead of voting, they just skip town. I need you. The legislature needs you. The people of Oregon need you. The Oregon Senate can only hold a vote if two-thirds of its members are present, which is called a quorum. No Republicans, no quorum, no vote. It's a simple strategy, and both parties have used it in the past. The plan this time was for Republicans to abscond until the end of the legislative session on June 30th, potentially killing the bill in the process. But the government has a failsafe to deal with this strategy, the cops. Governor Kate Brown sent the Oregon State Troopers after the senators to try to bring them back and force them to vote. Senator, 
Hey, how's it going? Good out here. One of the missing senators agreed to meet with us on the condition that we not reveal his exact location. So we'll be there in uh, just a moment. All right, sounds good. All right, see you there. We're going this way. Going this way, okay. So this is it. This, this is the hideout. Yeah, this is uh, this is where I'm living. It's a humble little place, and right on the lake here. Yo, is that a police boat? Yeah, yeah. You, you think they're looking for you? No, they're uh, probably checking to see if they have life jackets and all that kind of stuff. That's you definitely got your head on a swivel, though. The, I, the lights went up, and you immediately. Yeah. Yo, that's that's the cops right there. Yeah. You sure they're not looking for you? Yeah. They're not after me. Where are we? We are at a lake in the northwest in a cabin. Is that all you can tell me? Well, I can tell you it's in Idaho. Okay. Yeah. All right. So yeah. we're making some progress. Okay. Yeah. If the Idaho State Police decide to cooperate with Oregon State Police and they come over here and they say, hey, you got to go. What happens? Well, that's a hypothetical. I don't think your hypothetical is going to happen. OK. Uh, but I do have my passport with me. You have your passport with you? I do. You're going to flee the country uh, over this? Well, you know, one would never know. The people of Oregon essentially have spoken. They've elected these people. This is what the makeup of the Senate looks like. Right. Wouldn't going into the meeting, casting your vote, wouldn't that be doing your job? Well, it wouldn't be representing the constituents that elected us. But it would be representing the constituents of Oregon as a whole, if they have chosen this makeup of the Senate. Sure, but we weren't elected by those constituents. We were constitutionally elected by uh, the districts we represent, and the districts we represent oppose this bill. And so the bill passed through the House, and our only opportunity to have any influence on this bill was to stop the vote. When the senators left, they got a lot of support. Some of that came from far-right militia groups. And police asked for the Capitol building to be closed on Saturday due to a potential threat. But most of the supporters who showed up weren't militiamen. Carol Williams set up a GoFundMe to help support the senators while they're away. So far, it's up to over $40,000. People think they're not doing their jobs. They actually are doing their jobs. They're doing exactly what I elected my senator, Fred Gerard, as my senator. And he's doing exactly what I elected him to do. He's by standing up here. for me. He's, he's, yes, by not being here, he's standing up for me. There is a part that, that does sound very strange, though. Well, you can spend it any way you want. I stand by what I said. And they are doing exactly what I elected them and are paying them to do. Senator Manning is an Army veteran who was appointed to the Oregon Senate three years ago. He was not amused by his missing colleagues. I've had bills that I wanted to get through that didn't make it. I didn't pull up stakes and said, OK, well, I'm not coming in to give help with a corp anything. You know, I'm going to take my ball and go home. I didn't do that because the people of Oregon deserves better. The Republican senators who are gone right now, they're, th for them, this is a political protest. You can protest on the floor. That's why we had debate. You don't have to run and hide. That's not protest, that's hiding. If the senators don't come back through July 1st, what happens then? Oregon will be on a life cycle that will only go up until September, and major funding in a lot of areas uh, will cease. This morning, Senate President Peter Courtney announced that HB 2020 wouldn't survive. House Bill 2020 does not have the votes on the Senate floor. He didn't give an official reason, but it looks like the Republicans leaving ended up eroding support for the bill among Democrats. The Republican senators who've left, they've said, we want to put this vote to the people. You're saying now one of the bargaining opportunities right now is to take it off the Senate floor put the vote to the people as a compromise. That's that's what I'm saying. It sounds like, it, maybe, does, it sounds like they won. It, it does sound like they won, but then the message is clear. They are willing to jeopardize your entire livelihood. They're willing to defund 
uh, schools, uh, social and uh, uh, medical program, uh, highway construction, highway project, they're willing to defund all of this under the guise that is one bill. Let's say you get exactly what you want, that you're able to stop the vote and you get what you want. If this is really successful, are you worried that this might set a bad precedent for people just, oh, hey, other senators in other states, we, we can just leave. This is a pretty good tactic. Well, they have. Uh, but then it happens more. Yeah, I don't know that it'll happen more because it's not that easy to do. And um, it's very rare that you have uh, a caucus that's unified enough to do it. What if people start saying, making that decision more often? Yeah, I don't think they will, but. Hey, I'm Hatchy, and I'm going to be talking about my song Obsessed off my album Keepsake. But it's okay, yeah, it's okay, but I do. The song Obsessed is mainly about like getting obsessed with a best friend. I've always had best friends who I felt and convinced myself were like better than me in every way and like prettier than me and more fun than me and more popular than me and even though we had a great relationship and they hadn't done anything wrong I kind of grew to resent them due to my own insecurities. This song came together so quickly in like a, a you know an afternoon. So I did it all in my room at home uh, starting with the guitar and the drum machine. I literally just was recording a demo and just copied and pasted that like 20 times in a row and then added in the bass line. Yeah, there's like the guitar lead line that's like... Which is just like the same three or four notes. And then the bass line does something similar, but it's lower. It's like... Really repetitive, really simple, really compressed music. Blow up my friends, then cry about being lonely. I spent a lot of time when I was younger not liking my voice. I've always had like a choir voice, probably because I was in choirs for like a decade when I was younger. I think I just really wanted to write something that was lower in my register. But it's okay, yeah, it's okay, but I do. I really wanted to have like a few little parts that sounded like they'd been sampled to kind of create the feeling that this song had been pasted together, like a scrapbook or something. I think maybe the most challenging part of writing and recording this track was stopping myself from overdoing it. I really had to remind myself that I wanted it to be simple. You were the one, you were the one who told me to run. And this is like one song that I was really excited when I wrote it. I felt really good about it. and. I listened to it heaps over and over again and I felt like, you know, you could dance to it and you could jump around to it. Whereas so many of my songs are just so serious and so heavy and that's not really what I'm like as a person. I just wanted something that kind of reflected my personality a bit more and I feel like this song does that. I love this song. It's one of my favorite songs I've ever written. 